we are just days away from hell in a cell. And we are in the last Monday Night Raw before the big event. My name is Marcus Stewart. Welcome to Call It In The Ring. Talking about Monday Night Raw, the uh, uh, September 10th show of 2018 from uh, New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana, the site of WrestleMania 30 and WrestleMania 34 earlier this year. And we have got a lot to get through in terms of the final push to get us to the cell, the final, the, the big cell, the hard cell, as they say in the biz, the, the big hard cell. So, but before we hop into all that madness, thanks for listening and be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening to this on uh, YouTube, you can also download and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Just search for Marcus Writes About Games. And you'll find all the episodes of both this show as well as my other video game uh, related podcast. You can do the same thing on Podbean. Same name, Marcus Writes About Games. So now to that bit of housekeeping's out the way, let's get started with Raw. So we open up with Braun Strowman, Dolph Ziggler, and Drew McIntyre, the three-man power trip, as it were, making their way to the ring, but they don't come alone. They bring um, most of the heel roster with them, their Injustice League of villains, and uh, the the bad people surround the ring as the, uh, the, the new trio cuts a promo, saying how, you know, we, we run raw, we're the best. And, you know, Drew and Dolph won the tag titles last week. And Ziggler is bragging about how he told us so. And how um, oh, McIntyre shows up, shows us a video package recapping everything that happened. Um, get used to video packages tonight because there's quite a few of them. And then Braun says that, hey, you know, Roman, you've got your hounds of justice. But I've got my dogs of war. Which may or may not stick. It's not a terrible name. The dogs of war. And he says, uh, you know, we're we're going to go uh, take over the WWE, the three of them, and that this represents change and a balance of power, or a power shift, I should say. And that what uh, Strowman did to Roman last week will be nothing compared to what he does to him in the Hell in a Cell this Sunday. Of course, this brings out the shield coming in through the crowd, as is their custom. And the the bad guys are ready for them, but what they are not ready for is um, as the uh, the shield hits the ring side area and starts uh, fighting her way out, Ambrose whips out a bag containing axe handles, and he passes them out, and the shield beats down all the bad guys with axe handles, which, that's different. Um, every heel apparently sucks on Raw, because all... How many of them were there? Maybe like 12? Something like that? Not including, you know, uh, the, the trio the big trio in the ring, um, they all kind of got their asses handed to them, which includes the Authors of Pain, which, you know, in, in kayfabe and storyline, the authors by themselves should be more than enough to at least give the S.H.I.E.L.D. A, 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 some trouble. But, you know, since they are uh, weakened by the combined uh, loserness of the other heels, which also includes Kevin Owens, who's in there too, and who else is out there? The Ascension, Jinder Mahal. Uh, Jinder, in particular, took a really big shot to the head from Ambrose from that axe handle. But uh, they just kind of get, you know, kind of treated like tr- chumps here, which is uh, kind of a problem, given that there's no, outside of those three, there aren't a ton of super credible heels on Raw. So it's like, uh, it's like I get what you're going for, but, yeah, that's a bit much. So... Um, the, uh, the, the three man power trip, dogs of war, whatever you want to call them. They, they escape before they are, um, before they are shellacked by an ax handle by the shield. Um, interesting way to start the show. Ax handles. That's a new one. Um, why not? I mean, it's not bad, I guess. It's just kind of weird. Like why not get like pipes or, um, I mean, would, would it be too hokey if they had, uh, police batons? Maybe that'd be a bit much. Yeah. Okay. Maybe pipes or bats. Um, maybe Sting has that trademark or something, but okay. Axe handles. Anyways, um, this brings us to the back where we see, uh, the shield shield is with Corbin and he's got cops again and he's threatening to arrest them again. Um, the shield's like, you're not going to do that again. But then Corbin kind of 
makes an, an ultimatum saying that, hey, if they if they don't leave right now, he's going to sh- have not only have them arrested, but he's going to strip Roman and Seth of their respective championships. The Shield reluctantly leave after intimidating the police. But, of course, this will not be the last that we see of them tonight. Uh, let's see. Earlier in the day, the Bellas had their locker room vandalized by the Riot Squad. And by vandalized, I mean they wrote, like, Brie mode on the wall. And then they crossed out Brie and put Riot. So it's Riot mode now, which I don't think that sounds as good. As catchy with a uh, a synthesized voice, can you say like "Riot Mode"? It's not quite as it's not quite "Brie Mode," but yep. Yeah. Um, man, the Riot Squad should just like start. I mean, if they, if they really want to be chaotic. They should just like start writing everything in feces and um, I don't know, maybe sacrificing an animal in their locker room, something like that. But that might be that might not play well on TV. Anyways, this sets up our first match of the night. Ruby Riot taking on Nikki Bella. Nikki's first solo match back on Raw and sometime. And um, this was, you know, this was fine. It was whatever. Uh, Nikki is still the better performer of the two, despite being the more annoying uh, personality of her and her sister. Um, Nikki, of course, picks up the win after Liv Morgan tries to interfere, but is, is promptly stopped by Brie who thankfully does not manage to um, to to botch this or hurt herself uh, pulling Liv out of the ring. So so it's a good night for Brie Bella. Uh, you know, Rack Attack 2.0, which, which is basically a TKO, which is a good finisher. And the only thing that was annoying about this match was the commentators uh, sucking up to the Bellas constantly, which gets old after a while. Which, by the way, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the show. Renee Young is now the permanent replacement for Jonathan Coachman, which means she will now be commentating on Monday Night Raw going forward, making her the first woman to join the broadcast booth permanently, not even on Raw, but um, I guess at least, um, well, yeah, I guess in Raw and I guess on any WWE major TV show. I mean, she did commentary in NXT uh, back in the early days. She's she's done SmackDown, I think, once maybe. Um she definitely did an NXT back in the day, but yeah, that's really cool. And no more coachman, which yay. Though I believe he's still with the company. I think he's literally swapping roles with Renee. Like I believe he'll be hosting the, uh, the pre-show and you know, you really don't need her doing backstage interviews. Cause you got like Charlie Caruso and, uh, you know, like, uh, what's his face? Uh, uh, Mike, Mike Rome, that other guy. Um, I'll miss her back there because she's the best personality of, of them all, but I, I welcome her to the Monday Night Raw booth. So yeah, congrats to Renee Young. That's super cool and really <laughs> a big step up from coach. So cool beans all around. Um, let's see, we get a, uh, uh, Connor's cure presentation. Of course, this is the, uh, the Connor, the crusher, um, uh, month. I forget the actual name of the uh, like the charity, but it's like the the Connor's Cure thing that they do every year, which is which is cool. You know, some fans might kind of roll their eyes at these presentations and think they're hokey, but you know, it's hard to make can't really make fun of charity. It's all for a good cause, so I have no problem with this. You know, you just kind of put up with the, the time it takes on the show, but it's still a cool cool thing. So you know, can't really say much about that. Thumbs up. What I can talk about is we get another recap of Undertaker versus Triple H, or Triple H, Undertaker and Shawn Michaels from last week, um, a long recap, uh, highlighting kind of the um, the scatterbrained uh, storytelling on the show, because they have so many shows that they're building towards, it feels schizophrenic right now, and it's kind of, this show might highlight it worse than any of the past shows. Uh, yeah, long recap, really didn't need to see all of that. Um, what we did see, though, was the AOP, the former Authors of Pain, who apparently they're not going by the Authors of Pain anymore. They're just AOP, the or AOP, OP, AOP, whatever you want to call them. AOP is talking with their new manager, Drake Maverick, who is now um, sans uh, tactical vest and is wearing just a, a wife beater like the ones that they wear. He still looks like a giant dork, but... <laughs> Um, at the same time, I could kind of appreciate a manager that dresses up like their, uh, clients. It's very 80s WWE, like you would see, um, like Jimmy Hart 
would change his attire to be themed after the, the superstar he was managing and, and Bobby Heenan would too, to a degree. So it's a very old school thing. Uh, I appreciate it, but it also doesn't make Drake Maverick look uh, less like a dork in uh, to be a scrawny guy in um, AOP gear. But he's hyping them up because they have a match uh, with two jobbers named Ronnie Ace and Nathan Bradley. And Ronnie Ace was a very pale, pale man with long hair. He was like a pale looking Heath Slater almost. Um, and of course, they get annihilated, just eaten alive, a public execution. Uh, the Super Collider puts both of them away in very short fashion. AOP uh, looks good. I, I, I kind of, I'm gonna miss the Authors of Pain name. I, I, I could see why Vince wouldn't like it. Maybe he thinks it sounds hokey. And I remember I thought it was kind of hokey when they first debuted at NXT, but I, I don't know. I grew to like it. It, it, it was one of, one of those names that grew on me over time. Of like the Authors of Pain, like that just sounds cool and it's creative. So AOP, it's kind of. I don't know. Would you wonder what AOP means if you didn't know it meant Authors of Pain? So, I don't know, you know, whatever. But they need to get into the tag title picture. Um, it, the problem is that, as I've said for weeks, there's no viable face tag teams. There's no legitimate good guy teams. They're all either jobbers or comedy acts. Uh, so that's a, that's a huge problem that Raw has right now. So... Let's move on to another um, another thing. We had a uh, a video hyping Randy Orton and Jeff Hardy cell match, and these were this was the first of several video packages for um, Hell in a Cell, and particularly SmackDown, which I don't. On one hand, I get because this is the go home show, so you're trying to cover the the card and get everything uh, um, promoted and get some shine. But at the same time, this is Raw, and why are you why waste time? on Raw hyping up a SmackDown match if it's separate brands and you're supposed to be technically on paper competing brands. So why would you promote the other brands stuff? Um, so this was weird to me. Like, why not just leave that to SmackDown and then use that time for a Raw thing? Hype up a Raw match or something. So we would see these um, throughout the night. Another uh, backstage segment, we see Triple H arrive in his fancy limousine. And he comes out to the ring to a really big ovation, big Triple H chant. And he cuts a, uh, a I would say he cuts a long promo, try, being really dramatic, talking about his match with Undertaker. But he just he pull, he just becomes Triple H. That's just Triple H's promo style is that he talks for a really long time to often um, explain something that could be um, that could have been said in half the time it takes him to say it. Uh, he comes out talking about how disappointed he is in Undertaker because Undertaker threw a, at least in his mind, a little hissy fit about Sean having an opinion about Triple H being better than Taker at this point in, his, in their careers. And he's like, I would never expect Undertaker to react that way to Sean having an opinion and saying that he realized that he, that Taker doesn't have respect for himself anymore because the Undertaker he knew would never have cared about such a thing and you know like polls or what everyone think or what sean thinks at least um he says that he has very little respect for the undertaker at this point and that at you know the super showdown in australia he's gonna put him down once and for all and all this stuff about how after their series at WrestleMania, Taker wasn't the same and became a shell of himself and nothing but a reputation. And pretty much they're just trying really hard to make this match into something. Uh, but it, it, I mean, for me, I can't get excited about it because it's like, you know, Undertaker is one of my all-time favorites, like top three. And Triple H is a guy I've always I definitely recognized that he's great. Um, he's just never been a guy that I've ever been like, oh my God, Triple H. Um, but he's an amazing villain. But... As great as these two are, it's just, I, I don't really have no desire to see them wrestle <laughs> in 2018. Because um, I just, not to be a negative Nancy, but there's no way it's going to live up to their past encounters. Especially their last match at WrestleMania 28 in the Cell, which was a great match. That's, yeah, like, I don't, I don't care. And plus, there's nothing at stake. Like, I don't, neither guy needs the win. So I don't care who wins. I... 
you know, if I have to choose, I'd rather Taker win, and that's just purely because I I like Taker more than I like Triple H, but it doesn't really matter either way. Um, it's This story is kind of just wedged in between all the other stories and builds going on right now, and uh, I, I just, I can't, no matter what they do, I just can't really get into it. It's just too... It's just too um, too divided, too separate from everything else that's happening. It's just like this weird side, like, not even like side story, but it's like a, another, like it's a different show basically when this happens. You're like, oh, okay, yeah, there's this other thing happening that we're supposed to care about. So, I don't know, like, for me to not care and being a fan that grew up in the prime of both of their careers, like when they when their era was the era... And for me to not really care, I, I I, can't be the only one that's struggling with having interest in this match, right? Especially, again, since this is the only match that's been announced for the Super Show. Like, what else is going to be there? Because um, they're, tele- they're showing it on the network. Like, why should I watch this outside of this one match? You know, what's what else is happening? So, I don't know. This The Super Show just needs to come in and end so we can stop building towards 50 shows at once. Anyways, B-Team... They are taking on Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler in their rematch for the Tag Team Championships. Um, This was another competitive match, which is kind of odd because the B-Team, even though they've had a win streak, they're still, it's still Curtis Axel and Bo Dallas taking on Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre. I, I said last week it was okay because neither team were prepared for each other, but this week, uh, this, I feel like it should have been more, just more of a destruction from uh, the tag champions here. They do win, of course, you know, Claymore, zigzag combo. And then after the match, uh, Seth Rollins and Amb- Dean Ambrose jump them from the crowd. Uh, sans shield gear, they are just in their normal Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose um, attire. Um, they beat them up. Seth goes with a curb stomp on Dolph. Uh, Drew pulls Dolph away before he can have his head crushed. And, you know, Seth's normal music plays us out. And this is clearly leading towards the uh, the tag, t- a tag title match, which, you know, at the cell between the, the two teams. Um, Dolph still has a rematch clause for the Intercontinental Championship. So is that going to happen? I mean, on one hand, I don't mind a break from that particular story because it's something that's they've been kind of doing for a while so i i when i i i'm i can i can ha- i can take a break from the ic title program but just from a logic standpoint is like um shouldn't dolph want his other championship back and to potentially become a dual champion shouldn't that be his focus like hey i want my rematch dude so yeah when is that gonna happen so eh let's see um Mick Foley, he gets another thing that's just kind of all over the place. Mick Foley, who is going to be on the show tonight to talk about the 20th anniversary of the um, his Hell in a Cell match with The Undertaker at King of the Ring 98. And we get a pretty nice video of the match. It's kind of, you know, with different legends talking about how insane that match was, which it absolutely is. And if you've never seen it, fire up the WWE Network and watch the match as it's... The insanity of that match still holds up today because there really hasn't been anything quite like that in terms of just the sheer violence and insanity of that match. Um, so if you look it up. It's definitely worth watching. One of the greatest matches of all time and still the craziest Hell in a Cell match of all time. But, you know, video on that. Backstage, we see Corbin, Constable, well, I guess he's not, well, I guess he's still Corbin, Constable, GM, Interim General Manager. Interim General Manager, Constable Baron Corbin. I guess that's his official job title right now. He is confronting Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose saying, I told you guys not to come back. I warned you that if the Shield returned, I was going to get you arrested and take your titles away. Um, Seth says he didn't see the Shield out there. And Dean's like, yeah, we only saw Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. There's no there's no Shield if there's the two of them. You know, it's got to be three guys. They weren't wearing their, their riot gear and SWAT stuff. So... 
you know, there's there's no issue here. Um, thankfully, Corbin does not buy this, and it's them just being dicks and not actually seriously presenting that as a loophole because that would have been ridiculous. But Corbin's like, you know, all right, guys, cut the crap. You know, I warned you. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know, um, I'm gonna live up to my promise. And then a dean yells for a guy to come in, and it's a cop, a Louisiana cop. And Seth accuses Corbin of falsifying the police report from last week and threatens to press charges against Corbin because, you know, in Louisiana, the, he can do that, I guess, loth stuff. Because um, that's what wrestlers do now is they threaten each other with arrest. <laughs> and um, Corbin kind of backpedals saying, hey, you know, we could talk about this. Uh, Seth says, yeah, let's let's talk about this privately. So Dean leaves with the cop and we see Dean go back out. He has a kind of a funny conversation with the cop, like a brief little chat about how about speeding laws and how Seth apparently or Seth uh, apparently Dean might have been speeding. But, you know, he's saying, you know, you know, there probably shouldn't have been a stop sign in that, in that place. And, you know, it was a suggested speed and showing a little bit of the Ambrose of old. Not a lot. He's still very much serious. In fact, this whole promo is or the segment, it was kind of goofy, but Dean was still very much, like, angry and not jokey. Like, he had he had a little bit of humor, but it w- he was still sh- kind of straight-faced about it for the most part, um, if that makes sense. Like, compare it to old Ambrose, where he would have been all over this, this segment being kind of more wacky. Whereas this Dean was just kind of like, um... It was dialed back in a way that I I still like. I still like this more serious incarnation of Ambrose. Um, so it's I mean it's it's weird that he's you know he's doing he has this big character reinvention, but we don't really get to see it in full because he's kind of been thrown right back into this uh, into the shield. So he's kind of in a he's sharing the spotlight with his uh, with the other two guys. So he, we haven't had a chance to see Ambrose in a single capacity since he's come back. So you've only gotten glimpses of, or like, kind of cursory glances at his new his new character or his new reinvention, I guess, of himself. Um, so that's um, somewhat disappointing on on some levels, but it's interesting on others. Um, Seth comes out and says that hey, everything's straight. Corbin's not going to throw us in jail. Um, Dean tells the cop that if he gets arrested again, he'll call him. Um, the cop's last name is also Ambrose which it was on his name tag, by the way. And I I think they, the camera tried to somewhat make a point of it. Like he didn't zoom in on the name tag, but he held the camera on the cop long enough for at least to at least maybe give you time to notice. And I'm assuming that's what the joke was. Um, so whatever. I do like that. They, um, that this kind of reinforced Seth's role in the shield as the, the brains, as he's the one that kind of came up with this plan of, kind of uh manipulating corbin into giving them what they want so well done on that in terms of just character you know character consistency we'll say anyways kevin owens is taking on tyler breeze and before tyler can do anything he's doing his apron you know pose where he's looking at his selfie stick uh kevin drop kicks him to the floor immediately uh the bell does not ring but that does not stop Kevin from beating the fashion out of Tyler Breeze and hitting the apron powerbomb, which back in the day would write Tyler off of TV for a good while. And maybe it will here. Who knows? But the, there's no match because, again, the bell did not ring. And Owens grabs the mic and cuts a very intense and angry promo saying that, yeah, I quit two weeks ago because I was sick of this place. And honestly, when I left, it felt liberating. But as soon as he left... Corbin immediately came to him and begged him to return. And Kevin said he would under the condition that he does not want to be held responsible for things like what he just did to Tyler Breeze. And Corbin has granted him. So apparently Kevin now has um, immunity from like basically from punishment of any kind. So Kevin goes on and on about how he can literally do whatever he wants he can beat the crap out of people and, and try to end their careers and he will not face any um, any judgment. Um, and he blames Lashley for all of this. He's like, you're the one that brought all of this on Raw because you injured my best friend, Sami Zayn, which is why I beat the crap out of you last week. 
And he says that from this point forward, it's going to be all about agony, uh, or anarchy, agony, and destruction. And that could be on a t-shirt, and it probably will be by next week. Um, but it was nice to see intense Kevin Owens again, which we they have a habit of kind of whipping that out or being really up and down with Kevin. Like, he'll be either be kind of the, the cowardly, um, snarky Owens, and then you get the, like, I'm going to murder you and hurt you and I want to fight people Owens. Um... A lot of, they always kind of flip-flop between which one, and it's, they do it too much sometimes. Um, so, I am, I hope we, that this Owens, the serious, I'm gonna powerbomb you on the ring and break your spine, Owens, sticks around for a good while to kind of build him back up. Because, like what I mentioned before, uh, Raw is in need of some really top, legitimate heels, especially with Roman as champion. And since he'll likely defeat Braun this Sunday, he's going to need fresh you know, from fresh challengers, depending on how long they want them to hold on to that belt. We get a recap for AJ Styles and Samoa Joe, um, promoting their cell match. Again, uh, does this really need to be on Raw? We get a tag match next uh, between Bobby Roode and Chad Gable taking on the Ascension and a rematch from last week where Chad more or less destroyed the team by himself. Um, the, the entrance of Gable kind of popping up as Rude is doing his entrance and looking really happy is kind of funny. Um, and this was another kind of uh, building on that story where Rude starts the match, but Chad immediately tags himself in before Rude can do anything. And then Chad just goes um, just beast mode on the Ascension like he did last week and is just throwing them around and making them look like, I uh, well, I guess I would say making them look like jokes, but that, that's kind of already what they are. So he, I guess he's making them look like the Ascension. Um, eventually Bobby gets into the match and he does a little bit of offense, but then, um, right when he's, uh, getting, he's, he's powering up, so to speak, he's, he's getting the crowd ready to hit the glorious DDT and Chad tags himself in again and hits the, that rolling chaos theory suplex to get the win. And Rude isn't really annoyed by this. He's just kind of happy that this kid is probably just doing all the work and winning matches. So he, he, he didn't seem all that miffed by it. So this is still continuing the story that again, I hope it ends with either rude ex, um, exploiting Gable to get him wins and letting him do all the work on purpose and just piggybacking off of, off of him until eventually um, Gable either wises up and is like, hey, I'm doing all the work. but Or if Rude becomes more and more arrogant and starts stealing the glory for a, a, a one-man team where he's being carried. Or, based on this match, maybe Rude at some point gets tired of Gable's um, show-stealing and enthusiasm and he just turns on anyway. I'm cool with either one because they both get the same desired result of Rob, Bobby Roode finally turning heel. He needs to be heel. God damn it. Once again, think about how the heel situation is on Raw. Heel Bobby Roode would be perfect right now. He, because heel Bobby Roode is world championship material and has been proven as such. So, uh, this story, I'm interested in it because this might finally be the means to get to that end. Let's see, Dolph Ziggler is backstage with his uh, his fellow uh, dogs of war, and he's bitching about the shield coming back and how can this happen. Baron Corbin comes in and informs them that, you know, he can't have the shield arrested because apparently Seth has invoked some sort of Louisiana law called a Napoleonic Code. He does not elaborate what that means, but that is what, that is what we are told. And he announces that at Hell in a Cell, Drew and Dolph will have to defend the Raw Tag Team Championships against Seth and Dean. And Drew is upset and saying, why on earth should they do this? Uh, Corbin says that Stephanie more or less is pushing for the match because, you know, the Cell is Corbin's first pay-per-view as a GM. And he and his, him and Steph agree that it's got to be big. And what could be bigger than that epic encounter? Which which seems to calm Drew down. He kind of He kind of gets it. And then Braun decides that he is going to go a big dog hunting because he can't wait to get his hands on Roman. He wants him tonight. Uh, we This brings us to our another tag match. Uh, Ronda Rousey and Natalia taking on Alexa Bliss and Mickie James. So we got Ronda's uh, second match on Raw. It's always good to see her uh, get some ring time. Um, Alexa and Mickie eventually, uh, they spend a lot of time uh, beating up 
Natalia as Rondo was on the uh, the apron. You know, they tried to keep Natalia from tag- tagging Rondo, which is just you know logical storytelling. Is why would you want the tornado of chaos known as Ronda Rousey to enter the match? Um, at one point, Alexa slapped the crap out of Ronda as she's on the apron. And you know Ronda's not going to take that lying down, so she gets in the ring and sprints after Alexa, chases her into the ring, which allows uh, Natalia to catch her, and uh, Natalia and Ronda hit an impromptu heart attack on Alexa, which is a nice little uh, tribute to, you know, Jim Neidhart, the late Jim Neidhart. Um, that does not end the match. I felt like it was like, that seems like that should have been the ending if you're going to do that, but it was not. Um, eventually, Ronda gets in the match and starts, you know, beating the crap out of everything, but eventually, um, Alexa outsmarts her outside the ring and throws into the barricade, hurting her ribs, and then they start telling a story of, um, Alexa and Mickey, um, staying on Rhonda's ribs, like, now that they're like sharks that smell blood, they have found a weakness in Rhonda's game, and they're just going to town on her ribs, which Rhonda does a decent job selling, and it's kind of necessary for someone as tough to beat as her, you need to have some sort of a chink in the armor, so this is as good as anyone. Uh, eventually, though, uh, Rhonda is able to uh, to come back and get slap on that arm bar on Mickey James as Alexa Bliss is sent outside to the ring and just kind of watches this because she's too afraid to go in there and help her friend because Alexa Bliss is a great villain. And, you know, uh, Natalia taps out to the arm bar. Of course, as Rhonda's celebrating, uh, Alexa gets a cheap shot on the ribs to hurt her and then scurries off again like a good villain. And Rhonda is looking very, very upset. Next up, we get a promo for Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair. They hate each other. They're going to fight themselves for the Women's Championship. Uh, we see backstage Elias. He spits some bad tea in the face of one of his helpers because he did not have chamomile he needs chamomile and his tea to to soothe his his uh heavenly voice and as he's being a jerk we hear braun Strowman screaming at the top of his lungs backstage storming around screaming for roman reigns he's like where's roman he jacks up a guy on the wall and he's like where's roman like he's gone full christian bale batman on people Trying to find a trigger man that is Roman Reigns. People are swearing that they have not seen Roman. Braun tells him to swear to me. Swear to the monster. Where have, you haven't seen Roman Reigns. And he is just he is just a, a whirlwind of destruction in his search. Speaking of destruction, Ronda Rousey is being interviewed and she is looking pretty, pretty PO'd. And Charlie asks her, you know, hey, are you going to be ready? Your, your ribs are hurt. She says she's never had to back down from a fight in her life, and not just because she's hurt, but because she has heart, and that even when she's hurt, she's still the best woman in the business, and it was just a nice, intense promo, and I, you know, Rhonda's never, if you've ever watched her UFC interviews, she can talk, and I like that they, at least as far as I know, I don't know if they're scripting Rhonda all that much, I think that'd be foolish to do, because like I said, she can talk plenty fine on her own especially if it's trash talk so just let her go out there and be trash talking ronda rousey and it feels real and genuine and um, intense and that's what it was here so ronda continues to (laughs) somehow to uh be one of the the best consistent performers on the roster honestly so anyway this brings out elias for his weekly concert he rips on the new orleans saints who i guess lost the football game the night before um, and then rips on Drew Brees. I think he's a player. I don't watch football, as you can probably get, tell. But, you know, New Orleans does not take kindly to hearing your team get uh, besmirched by the musician man. And Mick Foley interrupts, which at this point I've forgotten that he was supposed to appear on the show. He was, it's pretty late into the show that he shows up. And he has a haircut, and he kind of looks like a mix of how he looked in 2000 when he was the commissioner of Raw. But with a weird kind of short curly hair look that I don't know if I entirely like. <laughs> but it only he could get away with that, I guess. Um, and he, you know, he talks about the cell. And first he puts over Elias, saying that Elias has a future and is going to be a big star one day. Um, and Elias, but you know, also making fun of Elias, saying that there's no... Nothing genuine about his lyrics. And Elias 
gets in his face and, and talk, starts talking about how he apparently, when he was a kid, he was in attendance in Pittsburgh at King of the Ring 98. So he saw the Foley get thrown off the cell live. And he's saying, you know, I'm not going to lie. That was an important moment in my, in my life. But that was then and this is now. And right now, Elias is the future and pretty much, you know, tells him that he's the past and that he needs to get, get out of his ring. And uh, Foley reminds him that he is a legend and to not speak to him that way. And that he's not out here to relive the past, but rather to promote the future. Because with the Hell in a Cell being this Sunday, he felt like he couldn't just sit at home and not be involved in some ways. So he uh, got in contact with Stephanie McMahon and he pretty much pitched to her like, hey, I let me take part in this somehow. Like I can I can be a, the, the bell guy or enforcer or something. And eventually he announces that what they came up with is that he will be the special guest referee in the Roman versus Braun Universal Championship cell match. And, you know, that's big news, I guess. Sure. Why not? Um, I, <laughs> I, I guess it doesn't take away from the match. It doesn't need it, but it can't hurt either, probably. So cool i guess question mark um elias continues to make fun of uh, foley and then foley informs him that the other thing that stephanie allowed him to do was for old time's sake he gave him general manager powers for one night and said you can make one match on raw and he's like you know what since you want to be a you know a little punk i just decided to make a match so it's going to be you against this man and this man is not a man, but an extraordinary man that does extraordinary things. That's right, Finn Balor. Finn Balor versus Elias is going to be the main event match of the show. But before we get to that match, Braun Strowman is still backstage trying to find Roman Reigns. He is knocking over ladders. He is throwing water bottles at people down the hallway because he can. He is just, he's like, he is a one man riot squad, but actually threatening. So, um, cool, you know, just don't, don't be Roman Reigns, basically, is what the message is. This takes us back to the ring, where we have our match between Finn and Elias, and this was, you know, this was fine. Fine match, good fine match. Um, apparently, according to Renee, Finn likes to listen to soul music before he wrestles to kind of get him in the zone, which is, uh, that's an interesting tidbit, sure. Um, what do you like? Is he, is he like an old school soul guy? Does he like, like, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, or like Marvin Gaye, or Luther Vandross? Is he more of a 90s guy? Do you like, like, uh, New Edition? Belle Biv DeVoe, DeVoe, whatever they were called, the, uh, the, the other New Edition after one of, after Bobby Brown left? Is he a, uh, R. Kelly fan? I want a, um, a network special with Finn Balor, sh uh, showing off his, uh, his soul music collection. I want to hear this, so... Interesting, interesting little factoid about uh, Balor there. Um, Balor eventually gets the win with a roll-up, which is quite necessary because I think they even pointed out commentary that Finn has been, much like he often is, they really can't seem to find something for him to do consistently. They'll, they'll have him do a bunch of nothing and then give him one actual story, and then usually the story isn't great, either with, whether it's Corbin or like Bray Wyatt. They can never give him something that's really good unfortunately or substantial um so he's kind of back in that holding pattern of just kind of having matches every week which sucks for a guy of finn's caliber and finn is one of my favorite guys on the roster so i you know i have personal bias on that but um at least he won here which he absolutely should have because elias can easily bounce back from any loss as soon as he strums that guitar his previous loss really just kind of fizzles away you kind of forget about it because he's such he is such a big and popular personality. So Finn needed this one a lot more, and I'm glad that he got it. Uh, this brings us to an, an interesting segment where um, we see Bobby Lashley in a gym, and he's working out. And Leo Rush, who I did not realize was Leo Rush until he said he was Leo Rush because he's got a haircut, and he's got like, so he's got like a sh smooth or short cut. And he's hyping up Bobby Lashley, and he's in a suit and sunglasses, and he's being really loud and obnoxious um, on purpose, I believe. And 
I guess they're kind of teasing the idea that Leo Rush may be Lashley's like manager or hype man. And it, uh, Leo Rush, if you're not familiar, um, is a, a 205 Live wrestler. Um, he was in NXT previously, and he was a semi-well-known name on the indies. Um, he's only been on 205 Live for a few months. So is he also going to be a manager? Is that what they're doing with the 205 Live roster now? Is that when on the other shows, they just, they just become managers for the, the non-cruiserweights? Because <laughs> it just it's kind of crazy that we're seeing this immediately after Drake Maverick, the GM of 205 Live, has now um, du- is now doubling as a manager for bigger wrestlers. So um, he's hyping up Lashley. Lashley seems really annoyed um, and does not seem to be on board with this. Um, but Leo doesn't seem uh, perturbed by this. So, um, yeah, what a random development. <laughs> and... Uh, sure, I don't know. I mean, Leo Rush is super talented dude. I haven't seen too much of him. I don't watch 205 Live, so I've only seen him um, in NXT during his kind of brief stint there. Um, But dude's crazy athletic, so this seems kind of a weird way to, to use him. Um, I guess it gets to show off his personality, which I haven't seen much of, Um, unless he's been doing stuff in 205 Live, but... Uh, it was interesting seeing him um, being really loud and crazy like this because I I've never seen that side of Leo. So I wow, what a weird random thing. <laughs> so anyway, Braun Strowman he's still in the back on his manhunt for Roman Reigns. He is looking for that tactical vest. He wants to rip that tactical vest up and he wants to chew it up and eat it and spit it out. And he wouldn't swallow it because it's a tactical vest, so I don't think he could digest it. That's why he said he would spit it out. Anyways, he uh, runs into Charlie Caruso. Charlie Caruso tries to interview him. Braun's like, I'm asking the questions. Where's Roman Reigns? And Charlie makes a suggestion saying, like, hey, maybe you should just go to the ring and call him out. Because, you know, he'll come to you if you go to the ring. Sage advice from Charlie Caruso here. And Braun accepts it. So the show, final segment of the show, Braun goes to the ring and he calls Roman out saying, let's do this. Roman appears um, on the announce table and Rome, uh, Braun makes his way up the stage and they get into a big old fight on the stage. And at first, Braun has the upper hand. He's throwing Roman into the, you know, the, the video wall and all that stuff. Eventually, Roman, uh, as Braun is clearing the announce table to slam Roman through the table, uh, Roman uses the opportunity to make a comeback. And then eventually he lifts Braun for a Samoan drop and he gets like on top of the table and he jumps off the table, delivering a Samoan drop to Braun Strowman through the the stage uh, floor for a big old crash. And the show ends with Roman Reigns standing tall with the universal title. And that's how we wrap up Raw. So, uh, not a great go home show. I don't think I'm any more excited for Hell in a Cell than I was uh, coming in. Uh, this show again, it, the 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 Australia Superdome stuff is kind of getting in the way at this point. Uh, Foley being added to the match, whatever. Um, I don't know. Just this uh, the Shield the Shield story. There's uh, it's okay. It's just there's nothing else really. Like they're the only. You have the three biggest uh, good guys kind of in one story. So, like, outside of that story, there's nothing really else to care about. I mean, Finn Balor would be... This should be the time you would really be pushing Finn since he's probably the biggest name that's not those... That isn't the Shield. And, I mean, he got a win tonight, but, man, he needs... It'd be great if he was doing something meaningful. And it kind of sucks that the um, the icy title is kind of tied up in all this and isn't being uh, featured at the moment so Finn challenging for the the IC title would be a, a really great um alternative story to be to kind of complement the, the the main story of the shield stuff but it's not so I mean this has to get to the six-man tag that I would rather see than it, more than anything else uh maybe next week maybe next Monday in Dallas hopefully um but yeah it's just this story is is kind of dominating everything, and there's not really much else to be super invested in, especially when the other story is uh, Triple H versus The Undertaker, 
and two old guys, two awesome old guys, and two great old guys, and one of those old guys is my favorite, but it has nothing else to do with the show, and I, the match itself probably isn't going to be anywhere near as good as it has been in the past, so like, like I said before, I just can't get excited for that Super Show match, so yeah, the Cell, I mean, looking forward to seeing the Cell kind of come and go, and more than anything, I want the Super Show to come and go, so we can start getting a more narrowed focus and build towards um, whatever the next pay-per-view is after this. I don't even know, but so yeah, not a, a kind of a, a miss of a show tonight. So hopefully tomorrow night or tonight, I should say, um, SmackDown Live is better. We'll find out and you can hear my thoughts on that tomorrow when I review SmackDown Live. Um, thanks for listening, guys. Once again, um, like, share, subscribe. Let everybody know that Marcus Stewart is talking about wrestling. And if you enjoy watching the show, I appreciate um, the support. Until next time, guys, be sure to uh, check out my other uh, game videos like Carving Gaming Rushmores and my site, Marcus Writes About Games. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me at MarcusStewart7. That's the number seven, by the way. So, until next time, guys, have a great one. Adios. Adios.